thank you very much for all your talks. And I think most of us could see that you are in agreement in, in, in the way you, you frame migration. And um, this could stay with you. And you yeah. But what I would like to do now is like a short summary of what I have heard and maybe pose some connections. Later on, ask general questions to you that we haven't discussed yet, maybe. So, Stephen, you reminded us that migration is just a part of a larger social transformation that we experience in the world economy and societies at the moment. So we need to understand migration in the context of a social process rather than something in itself. Um, when flows of commodities and capital grow, flows of people also grow. And you, Thomas and Vanessa, in your presentations, you explore basically the spaces of transformation, the way I put it. Um, you gave examples from solidarity cities, and you gave example of a welfare state, which uh, basically has limitations dealing with migration. Um, and Vanessa, you also makes this question the very foundational principles of the welfare state that's based off principles of equality, uh, solidarity and inclusiveness, which most of us take for granted. And it seems like those principles do not necessarily extend to others and outsiders. And three of you have a clear historical approach and you're like kind of in line with um, looking at the continuities and ruptures in the historic, historical trajectories. So my question then would be, starting from this idea of social transformation to all of you, uh, whether or not human migration or mobility really transform the fundamental structures of our political institutions. Because when we talk about all these limitations and you show historical continuities, that how it was before the migrant was framed, <laughs> political inferiority of an uh, outsider, and you also show the limitations that has been uh, there uh, also in relation to welfare state. So what do you think? Is migration really transformative? Um, I mean, that's not really my argument. My argument mm -hmm. is that, uh, is it working? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Um, my argument is that um, economic and cultural and social transformation uh, all go hand in hand, that it's all part of the same process, that you can't separate from the effects of migration and the way migration is caused by um, economic change. So I think it's uh, all part of the same process. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to political um, institutions? Or I, th I think it's important to remember that nation states have always excluded a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm thinking um, of the theory of citizenship in the um, early post-war years in, in Britain, where the, uh, the idea was um, that um, you know, that the working class didn't actually have political and educational citizenship because they were excluded from, um, from the, you know, the mainstream institutions that created citizens were really reserved for the middle and upper classes. Mm. So um, I think the nation state has always excluded and in a way, I mean, the nation state is about exclusion. You can't really have a nation uh, without saying who belongs and who doesn't belong. So maybe the, our project should be, or as, as Thomas has indicated, cosmopolitanism. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just would like to ask Thomas something in yeah, that context. Good. And that is, do you see parallels between the way the Nazis used the term cosmopolitanism and the way your current president, Trump, uses mm. the term? <laughs> should, I, should I explain what I mean? You should, you should say that, because one, I have not researched Nazi cosmopolitanism. I, just, I, don't, I don't know. Um, uh, the second no, no. one is, did Trump use the word cosmopolitanism? Like, what was the context of his discussion? Well, I have not heard him say that. Well, the, the Nazi use of it was an exclusionary use. I mean, it was uh, Vaterlose Gesellen, you know, people with no home and no uh, fatherland. And, and that's why the, the, the Jewish populations were seen as a danger because they transcended the borders of the nation state. So that was a, it was a kind of negative. Oh, very negative. Ne negative cosmopolitan. Extreme, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just wondered if that's part of the mm -hmm. Globalist. And, and, and so, and, 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 is, 
has Trump used the term cosmopolitan to describe people people without homes and? I thought I'd heard him do so, but I mean. Uh, yeah, I think he uses glo globalists to also oh, okay. like elites. Yeah. This kind of like from the far right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah. Global, yeah, I'm not really sure what to make of the <laughs> global, to, I mean, you know, when, when I, with respect to the Nazi thing, <laughs> I think there's absolutely a similarity in the way that Trump has described the, 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 the narrative in barbarian invasions. I mean, that's not unique to Trump. That's, uh, you know, Patrick Buchanan, um, Hutchington's The Clash of Civilizations. There's a long running narrative about the invasion. I mean, literally, that's what um, Huntington says, is it's a Mexican invasion mm. of the United States. It's come to destroy American culture. Um, and in that way, I mean, you know, that's, I think that story is a very old one going back to the Romans, but Trump is absolutely a continuation of, you know, these homeless army of the poor and so on. It's, it's an invasion story of, of people without homes, without any, yeah, reflection on the historical conditions of that mobilization, which is kind of getting to the connection, the question of social transformation. I'm, I'm in agreement with Stephen on that. I think at the macro level, Historically, you can't really pull apart migration from climate change from, and yeah, climate has always had effects on human civilization. It's one thing people are starting to study a lot more. It's not just a contemporary uh, situation, but that there's always been this network of a whole lot of things. So I don't think social, at the level of macro history, I just don't think we can separate migration from all these other things. It's sort of built in. But at the regional, like if we want to look at specific cases, we could talk about and to, just to respond to your presentation, which is excellent, is about the rise of, for instance, my knowledge base is in the U.S., the rise of the prison industrial, the private, private detention uh, industrial complex in the United States. Mm -hmm. I would say that, I mean, that's, that's, that, that is a kind of relatively new transformation of the penal system, that it's an expansion of the private, uh, private prison system into now a multi-billion dollar industry that is perpetuating itself through lobbyists and so on that make sure that immigrants are criminalized so that they will end up in private detention for a very long time so that they can make more money uh, from, anyway, so at, at the social transformation, at regional levels, I think we could say yes, there are important differences that have to do with migratory movements, but at the macro level, I don't think you can really pull those apart. Um, so in the case of the, the, ca the caravan, I was saying earlier, like, is it climate change? Is it U.S. imperialism? Yeah, kind of all of those things and a lot more. Is it political violence, poverty? Yes, yes, yes. It's all of those things we can pull them apart. I just want to add, though, I, one of the things that I'm investigating in this new book has to do with um, a, a possible paradigm shift in the legal order, which I think is very concerning because I think we've seen a backlash against human rights. So we've had this mm. period of the growth of human rights protections, the creation of the European Court of Human Rights, um, the legitimation of human rights, and we've had a real pushback against that. Mm. And then when you actually look at the, I don't know if anyone's studying the, the law here, but if you actually look at decisions in the European Court of Human Rights, they're, they are, are, their decisions are in favor of the nation state, not for the individual. And we do mm. not have a legal mechanism that recognizes an individual as a legal entity. And what that means, that cr makes people incredibly vulnerable. So the point, you can move but not enter. Um, the only way you can seek legal protection is through a domestic, and you can't access any kind of um, supranational directly. So the legal precarity of people who are vulnerable um, is very serious, and I think that there, that may be more, one of these more macro or structural changes yeah. um, and a kind of cultural pushback against the idea that human rights are valuable and legitimate. And I, find, and I, 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 I am concerned about that because it's so easy for a country like Sweden to deny human rights of other people. Mm. Okay. And you, I also realized you mentioned uh, instead of refugee crisis, you said solidarity crisis. And a couple of you also, you also mentioned about the solidarity cities, and they changed their name from sanctuary to solidarity, which seemed to be less harmful in the context, I guess. Which is, um, which is more ambitious. It's more ambitious. Yeah. And how do you conceptualize solidarity? Uh, well, <laughs> or is this is this kind of the words that is borrowed yeah. from the social movements? Maybe I think. Well, or I think it does come from activism, and I think there were active um, academics in Sweden who started to really use this uh, and activists to use this term rather than to always, to reify this idea that it's a refugee crisis because that puts the crisis on the people who are seeking refugee. movement when it's really 
the crisis of this society. And so I think the solidarity crisis, it's a, it's a um, conceptual and rhetorical statement to re remove that stigma of the crisis from, from the people who are seeking movement, because it's how the societies are responding. And I think if we think, I think there's, human rights are not the, solu are not the kind of solution. There's a lot of problems with that. But when we think about solidarity, we can think about that dimension, which is also you know, rec recognizing the humanness of other people mm -hmm. um, and being in solidarity with that. And about the solidarity cities, would you have the similar experience? Because in your presentation, what I realized that you also talk about the city of Toronto, let's say, and solidarity city is not the same thing. So the solidarity movements are something that is completely uh, bottom up, but not really the municipality or so on. And you also see uh, examples of now uh, we have this fearless cities networks where actually municipalities also take these um, initiatives and work together with the social movements. Um, similar examples uh, could also be seen in Europe and, and in non-European countries, of course. Yeah. Um, sure, sure. <laughs> there have been a number of cases in Australia where people living in what we call rural and regional areas have got together when one of their, a refugee living in the neighborhood was about to be deported and have prevented that deportation. And it's interesting because we normally think of people living in country areas as being rather insular and prejudiced. And uh, what it really seems is more that um, if there, there is a familiar human face to lack of solidarity, then people mm. um, are willing to act. Mm. But th th you, c you can't tell them. I mean, it has to be something that develops on, his, uh, on its own. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so th that, that's another aspect of solidarity. Mm. So uh, when I was in Frankfurt, I spoke with some activists who had basically kind of a grassroot, grassroots organization where they just, you, there's a deportation order where the individual has to show up at a certain time or the uh, immigration will show up at their house. And so what happens is during the, like before immigration shows up at the house, this group will say, okay, I'll take this person for this time, I'll take them for this time. And then the person just leaves. And then during the period that immigration is trying to round people up to get everybody on a plane to be deported, there's a duration, there's a window. And if you can keep those people safe during the window, then this, they stop searching and then they'll wait again to next month and start a search again. But that's, I mean, there's a kind of precari I mean, a, an ongoing precarity that's not, I mean, I, 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 I hope that my, my, my talk about the Solidarity City was aspirational, but no, in no way utopian, because yeah. you still confront the fundamental problem of ongoing precarity because you're living in, you know, you under national uh, immigration law and you can't, that's not something that's gonna change overnight. And it's not something can be fundamentally changed. Uh, very easily or just strictly at the city level. But in the US, there's just this fundamental barrier to solidarity. I mean, maybe other countries have similar things, but there's a hotline you can call um, to call ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. You can just call them up no matter who you are. You can, you, don't, you can be a police officer who's not required to report people. You can be an individual who has a next door neighbor and you can call up federal immigration and report your workers, you know, your neighbors, you can report anybody. And that is just, is a fundamental instability that any, that, that, that there's a hotline you can call and that puts, that makes solidarity so important, um, but also not a guarantee either. Mm -hmm. A necessary but not sufficient condition well, you also have, just a final note on that, you have competing solidarities. So I addressed this in the book, where you had civil society movements, mm -hmm. refugees welcome, no borders, yeah. operating with one kind of solidarity and really you know, claiming sovereignty over these people, we're going to take care of them, they're, we're us. Um, and then you have the kind of national citizen solidarity. Mm -hmm. And Nancy Fraser writes about um, parallel frames of reference. And my question, you know, kind of to everyone is really, I mean, are, if, if some people are operating on this plane, like this is how they make sense of the world, and other people are operating on this plane, mm -hmm. how do we bring those together? Because I think this is the state we're in right now, right? This is non communicate we're not communicating because we think this is a legitimate way to go, and then these other people, this is a legitimate way to go. And we're kind of in this impasse right now, I think, in 2018, and mm -hmm. these, so what, what are ways of, of um, 
I'm not, I like, love these geom <laughs> geometry, but I don't, how do you bring those planes together, right? Is there an axis or, mm. you know, because there's kind of spinning, spinning in different directions and everyone thinks that they're right. Mm. Yes, exactly. And in practice, we also get to see it around the solidarity crisis uh, that there was so much interest in mobilizing for some reason, helping refugees, but it was so uh, competing let's say, or overlapping with, with many of the NGOs and c c citizens or migrant communities together, that people are now looking outside refugees to help, where they weren't that many, compared to the help that the, the people mm. mobilized. So then, then we also get to see that there is a kind of becoming very inefficient and delegitimizing some of the actions that they, mm. they have been trying to do. Um, so, um, having said that, before I open to the audience, would you like to comment on each other's uh, presentations or do you have co questions to each other? I sure. Um, I just had a question about your presentation um, uh, in Sweden, just because I don't know the context, but uh, is there that same rise of the, the sort of private uh, detention complex, because in the U.S. that's been huge, mm. but I'm wondering if there's an equivalent. Like you showed some of the images of the detention centers in Sweden, um, and I must say from the U.S. context, it's pretty tame um, compared to the detention system in the U.S., which is extremely brutal, crazy violent. The reports of, of, of assault in those detention centers is through the roof. I mean, it's this whole crazy thing, and I'm wondering what the, how it compares in the case of, of, of Sweden. Yeah, well, two points on that. I mean, people always want to say that Sweden has really nice prisons, and wouldn't it be nice to be in prison in Sweden? Um, it's not nice to be in prison or in detention anywhere. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible human suffering that goes on. So, like, this sort of measurement of suffering, I think we have to set those questions aside. Um, the other point, the, 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 there's not privatization in that sense, but you have one architecture firm in Sweden that designs all of this stuff, like sc <laughs> schools, detention, prisons, um, this kind of housing module. So there, there is that kind of interface, but nothing, nothing, on that, uh, nothing on that scale. The other thing with Sweden is that the, like the detention in the, in the US in some places has been about the confinement. Sweden, for a long time, didn't, th they resisted that. They, wanted, they just wanted to remove people. Um, so that's, it's been more of a removal um, of trying to speed up those, those removals. But during this 2015-16 period, the detention centers were full, so what they ended up doing was putting some people in prison, which is, again, like incredibly problematic. I didn't even talk about this, but the decoupling of crime and punishment undermines democracy. Mm. So putting people literally in a prison um, that was a handful of people, so the scale is small, we can think, oh, it's okay one person in that place is, is problem. Mm -hmm. mm. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to also open up to the audience for questions. There's one question over there. How do we transport this? We have to keep this with the other one. Yeah. We can go around. Thank you very much for your talks uh, and your comments here this, after, uh, this morning. Very, very interesting. Uh, my first question, uh, I've got two questions and not that long. The first one I think is directly to what you talked about this morning, Stephen. I was gonna ask you if you could uh, expand upon one of the points you made in your talk. You're talking about the 2008 economic crisis and how it has effects on uh, both neoliberalism, neoliberalism and its linkage to migration. I thought it was rather interesting to hear, uh, but I was wondering if you could just expand a little bit more upon your thinking there and uh, how you look at that. And that's the one question. The other question, I was thinking, Vanessa, you were talking about these different planes. Um, and I think it would be interesting to talk a little about silence, mm -hmm. uh, cultural silence, and how that's maintained. I think even we can talk about strategic silence and how that's used. I'm struck by the fact that as I speak to local politicians and uh, the civil servants who are employed to put their politics into work, uh, that there are a lot of people who refuse to speak about migration or the migrant. Um, it's a dirty word, uh, and it's a word which only the Swedish Democrats will talk about. And there's a fear that if we start to talk about migration, that we'll just be feeding into this sort of Swedish Democratic uh, me mentality. But if there's no place for us to speak, yeah. uh, then these are people who have no voices either. And I think that's something which is also worth considering. If we're talking about activism, how do we create forums in which people can actually have dialogues and maybe disagree, but at least communicate? Um, so maybe that's something which you would also like to link into from your work in Toronto. But thank you. Thank you. 
Um, just to expand a little on this issue of 2008, which I, I really do see as a turning point in the way the global economy, the global neoliberal economy has been developing. But I mean, it's, it's a turning point which was, you know, beginning to emerge before. It's not a sudden thing. And wh what is extremely common now in developed countries is casual employment. People paid by the hour or not even guaranteed a certain number of hours. You know, the, what they call in, in Britain the zero hours contract. That, you know, you're not allowed to take other work. You have to stay available for Amazon or whoever is your employer, but they call you in when they want you. Um, the, the other thing, as I, I think I did mention, the, this gig economy that people are paid, you know, for doing a delivery. They're paid by the delivery, not, not uh, having a regular uh, work relationship with the company that employs them, or turning people into independent contractors. Um, you see that a lot in the transport industry. You know, people have been given big loans to buy these huge trucks, which are very expensive, mm. and they have to drive an incredible number of hours to pay them back. And if they have an accident or the, the truck is damaged, it's them who has to pay and who are, isn't able to work until the, the thing is fixed. It, it doesn't harm the company that uses these so-called contractors. But the, I mean, there are lots of examples. I won't go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to, um, since I'm here, I'm just going to indulge uh, on this. I didn't show this other graph about silences and representation. So what's also at stake here is connecting, I think, to um, Thomas's concerns about democracy is the violation of the parity principle. So those whose these policies most affect don't have any say. And this is a um, graph of the Swedish parliament from, from Delmi, actually, the report on representation in the Swedish parliament comparing native born with foreign born. And so you have a clear disparity. So if we have mass, and this was also the same finding in the 2018 election. You have massive disparity of the so-called, you know, troublesome neighborhoods, representatives from those neighborhoods in decision-making power. So it's one thing to have civil society, social movements, absolutely vital. It's another to actually have mm. political power inside the state where you rewrite the law. This would be very easy for Sweden could have done uh, created humanitarian visas and solved the problem of the bureaucratic backlog during the crisis. They could have done that. So I, I just highlight this because we have a lack of representation of people who are affected by many of these policies in positions of power. Um, and you have this long, I think, that's why I talk about the ambivalence about dealing with difference. So I, I didn't, I, maybe it's obvious because of my accent, but I came, came from the U.S., so it did strike me when I came to Sweden, I've been here for several years now, that people are very reluctant to talk about race, ethnicity. You talk to students in class trying to teach a course on ethnicity and they think you're a racist. Hmm. Um, and they're really, they've grown up with this taboo, right, and a lack of language. So this when I talk about the fission and the fusion, right, this, should, this is a history to celebrate, right? There is, some celeb there is some things to celebrate, it hasn't all been you know, kind of forms of exclusion and violence, but mm -hmm. the lack of a language and a discourse to talk about these in a, in a, in a productive way, mm -hmm. which, and then you have this, um, I think, a very poor public discourse on talking about these issues, which allow this vacuum, and then you have the Sweden Democrats and others who can fill that vacuum with the language. They're prepared, and they're sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Just one quick comment on uh, what Vanessa is saying. <clears throat> in Australia, we have a very large number of m members of parliament who are either children of immigrants or themselves immigrants, and it's not really noticeable that they vote any way differently from, mm. from, from the others. I mean, it's more, you know, to maintain their position in the political party they're in, they have to conform. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not like as if there's some essentialist position that's going, going to be put forward, but we have a serious lack of, of, of political representation and the way the parties decide. You as a person can't decide to run for office, right? You've got to be in the party, and the parties main control, can maintain control over who can be a candidate. And so there's just massive exclusion of people whose voices could be part of that. Not that they're going to have some authentic or legitimate voice, but they're not even part of the conversation. Mm. Just... 
just tell us. Thanks. On just really quickly on the question of, of of silence and what we could possibly do. I mean, just this is a completely minimal gesture at the just the the discourse about immigration in the U.S. is just I mean, and many places just so completely empirically wrong that mm. step one, like I teach a class on the philosophy of migration, the step one is like I just give them this handout that's like here's everything that you hear that's false about immigration. Now we can have a conversation. Like here are all the true st statistics, facts backed up by studies, academics, and people who study this like know what's going on. And there's just crazy disjunct between what's actually happening and basically all of the bullshit lies that people hear on the media and our president is, you know, he's just, he's constantly saying things that are false and people believe it. Um, and so that, that's, that's like a really big, but it sounds like a very simple barrier of just let, know what's going on. You know, even just at the minimal level of just statistics and collection of like migrants are not stealing your social security. Like it's not, migrants supposedly don't pay taxes. Like all this kind of stuff is, yeah, is nonsense and it's really a big barrier. Yeah, alternative facts. Uh, we have two questions and they will be the final questions before we move on to the lunch. So, yes, and then it, uh, a microphone is there. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, can I ask our U.S. colleagues about the midterm elections in the in the U.S., uh, where we have some interesting? Uh, uh, and my question is really: Do you think that what happened was partly, uh, obviously, a reaction, partly to sort of Trumpism? But to what extent migration played a role? We have some interesting new uh, Congress women. We have a Somali refugee. Uh, we have a Palestinian woman, we have um, um, Alexandra something uh, from Puerto Rico, but, but also on the state level, wh where there seems to be an even sort of stronger, uh, I don't know if one should call it the backlash, but, but a reaction. Mm. To, to what extent do you think, because it's difficult at this stage to sort of analyze this, this uh, but what do you think uh, about, did migration play a role in, in the midterm elections? I know you guys have something to say too. Um, uh, just, for, just very quickly. I mean, I'm absolutely disappointed. I mean, just sort of echoing what Stephen said about Australians um, and the Labour Party not being not being sufficiently able to comment, and also the question of silence. Like the Democrats have been so silent on immigration. All this stuff about the caravan. Where are the Democrats out there? They have an opportunity to to do the right thing and to change the language about immigration, and they're not. They're totally silent because they believe and. I, I, I really hope that that's not true, but that a sizable portion of the U.S. is just racist and xenophobic and anti-immigrant, and so they don't want to rock that boat. They're still committed to a kind of immigration policy that's not really radically different than the Republicans. And the fact that they haven't come out and done anything or said anything against this caravan is, is in my opinion, just condemns the Democrats. So I don't think that in these midterm elections, immigration really played a significant role. I think Trump hoped that it would, um, if anything that might have hurt him, but not in any significant way. Like the Democrats didn't use this as an advantage. They didn't come out and say, look at these horrible things that Trump is saying about mm -hmm. this Im invasion of these, you know, poor, you know, people and they're coming, they're, they're harboring terrorists, terrorists, and they're funded by George Soros and the Democrats. Like, why didn't they come out and, and, and use this as an opportunity to gain votes? They didn't because their immigration policy isn't significantly different than the Republicans at this point. And that's disappointing. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, one more question we got from the back. Vasna. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talks. So as someone who's not a migration scholar, you've talked about both labor migration and asylum seekers and refugees. And I just want to understand a little bit better, is there a substantive difference in the experience of immigration that you see between these two groups? I really think there are three groups. There are highly skilled migrants, um, lower skilled migrants and refugees and um, they're all treated differently and um, I mean uh, well I don't want to go into a lot of detail I mean skilled migrants are encouraged low skilled migrants officially we don't need but they come in through um, contract arrangements 
and um, asylum seekers will, they, there's this very strange disjuncture. If asylum seekers come in by plane, they're allowed to live in the community while their claim is being heard. If they come by boat, they're locked up on one of these islands. Mm, yeah. um, I won't go into detail, but they are basically factories for mental, mental illness. And it's, it's interesting that um, the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea has said these things are illegal and they've forced them to close the one yeah. on Mainus Island. Think of Australia being lectured in human rights by PNG. I mean, you'd, you'd think that would be a huge shock, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been. I'll just, I think Betty's, Betsy's going to talk later about climate refugees. We're probably going to come back, back to that. But I want to just highlight why I think classification and categorization, this administrative power, is so powerful. Because what happens in Sweden, right? So you've had family reunification, labor migration, and then, you know, uh, refugees. These classifications are really problematic because people have intersectionalities. And then the idea, what's, I think what's problematic in Sweden is the idea that the refugee is the legitimate refugee, I mean the migrant. But then they get boxed in that they're somehow not considered a labor migrant. That, oh, there's so many problems of integrating into the labor market, oh, you know, and so they, they kind of get stuck in that box and then all sorts of state apparatus is oriented around the clients, around the services, rather than seeing them as active contributing. And I think there's one statistic, you know, many of the Syrians that came into the EU were some of the most highly educated refugees that we had had. Um, but that's, that's not put up first, right? It's that they're a, a problem and a drain. So the, all the categories um, are incredibly problematic. And I think it's, we'll even hear more about it later, about the, the, the classifications. Okay. Would you like to add something? I just agree. Mm. Okay. Uh, good, great. Uh, we have more questions I can see, but we can leave those to the next panel in the afternoon. Uh, lunch will be served outside. So let's get uh, an applause to three of you for, for all the morning. And thank you for your questions. Yes. <laughs>